Today we honor Levi Richard and his families. In the early days, if one citizen of Utah conversing with another had referred to Dr. Richards, he would probably have been asked which one he meant, Dr. Willard, Dr. Phineas, or Dr. Levi Richards, brothers and residents of Salt Lake City. Levi Richards was the fourth son and ninth child of Joseph Richards and Rhoda Howe and was born at Hopkinton, Middlesex County, Massachusetts, April 14, 1799. Levi, in his youth, was brought up as a farmer, though he had a natural genius for the mechanical arts, and at the age of 18 he obtained a situation that tended to improve and develop his ability in that direction. For 15 years or more, he devoted his energies to various mechanical pursuits and to the study of scientific works treating of those branches in which he was most interested. In his early manhood, he was also devoted to music, which was somewhat singular from the fact that as a boy he manifested scarcely a common aptitude for that art. He could scarcely whistle a tune. When about fourteen, however, a strain of the old familiar air Yankee Doodle came to him, and after this he attended singing school, and by diligent study and practice acquired some proficiency in singing, though he inclined more to instrumental music and learned to play on several instruments. His favorite, a clarinet, is still preserved in his family. Also, his commission as a musician of the band of music attached to the 2nd Brigade and 9th Division of the Militia of Massachusetts, given at Dalton, July 4, 1817. But while pursuing these special studies, he did not neglect to lay a solid foundation of the ordinary branches of education. He qualified himself as a school teacher, and when 19 years of age received a certificate from the school committee at Richmond, Berkshire County, Massachusetts, to the effect that he was a qualified instructor in the sciences, commonly taught in the district schools, and bore an unblemished moral character. Much sickness in his father's family induced him to give attention to the use of botanical medicines, and he became a skillful and successful physician of the botanical or Thomsonian school. It was in the year 1835 that he first became interested in Mormonism through reading the Book of Mormon, which made a profound impression upon him. In November of 1836, he with his younger brother Willard left their business and traveled to Kirtland, Ohio, there to investigate for themselves the new and strange religion. They became acquainted with the prophet Joseph Smith and being convinced of the truth of his teachings, were soon initiated into the church by baptism, 31 December 1836, with his brother Willard in the Chagrin River, Kirtland, Ohio. Having taken up his residence at Kirtland, Dr. Richards thought to relinquish the practice of medicine and devote himself to the work of the ministry. But being called upon by sick friends to prescribe for them, he did so with such success that solicitations increased and a general practice ensued. Among his patrons were the leaders, Joseph and Hiram Smith. The prophet in his personal history under date of June 14, 1837 writes, I continued to grow worse and worse until my sufferings were excruciating. And although in the midst of it all I felt to rejoice in the salvation of Israel's God, Yet I found it expedient to call to my existence those means which a kind providence had provided for the restoration of the sick in connection with the ordinances. And Dr. Levi Richards, at my request, administered to me herbs and mild food, 
and nursed me with all tenderness and attention. And my heavenly Father blessed his administrations to the easing and comforting of my system. For I began to amend in a short time, and in a few days was able to resume my usual labors. Thus pressed into service in his professional capacity, Levi devoted much time and attention to caring for the sick and comforting the afflicted among the people around him. He shared in the privations and persecutions of that period and faithfully fulfilled many important trusts placed upon him by the prophet and other church authorities. He left Kirtland in the company with his cousin Brigham Young on December 22, 1837. Levi traveled with Brigham to the far west and was in Missouri during the mob troubles that followed, culminating in the exodus of the saints to Illinois. In the history of Joseph Smith, under date of April 18, 1839, says, When the saints commenced removing from far west, they shipped as many families and goods as possible at Richmond to go down the Missouri River to Quincy, Illinois. This mission was in charge of elders Levi Richards and Reuben Hedlock, who were appointed by the committee. The name of Levi Richards also appears in the list of those who donated property to assist the poor among the saints out of Missouri. He continued to reside at Quincy during the year 1839, suffering much from fever and ague, common diseases in that part. Sick for seven weeks, he was reduced almost to a skeleton. When able to be around, his time was occupied in attendance upon the sick. In a letter to his brother Willard in England, dated at Quincy, September 22, 1839, he speaks of the trying scenes through which he had passed, and adds, Persecution has been almost constant companion of the church since you left, as I can witness. It truly seems that the judgment has begun at the house of God. In the year 1840, Levi was called on a mission to England. Accepting the call, he sailed from New York 7 October 1840 landed at Liverpool and spent two years laboring in Herefordshire, Monmouthshire, Gloucestershire, and other parts. The purity of his character and his self-sacrificing nature manifest in all his teachings and actions aided in winning many souls to Christ and often in establishing peace and good fellowship where previous to his approach confusion and strife had prevailed. Hundreds remembered him as one whose daily walk and conversation were calculated to enkindle that divine love and establish that sacred unity which always exists among those truly called the children of God. He returned by way of New Orleans to Nauvoo 12 April 1843 bringing with him about 180 immigrants from Europe. At Nauvoo, Levi held various offices of public trust. He was a member of the city council, elected to take the place of Brigham Young during the latter's absence in the spring and summer of 1844. In that capacity, he voted for the abatement of the Nauvoo expositor having previously spoken in favor of such a step, and was one of those arrested, tried, and acquitted for that official action. In the Nauvoo Legion, he was first lieutenant of a company of infantry, of which Lorenzo Snow is captain. He was subsequently elected Surgeon General of the Legion. The prophet's confidence in him as a physician, as well as a man, continued one evidence of which is the following compliment paid him in Joseph's journal, April 19, 1843. I will say that that man, pointing to Levi Richards, is the best physician I have ever been acquainted with. Firm as the hills was an allusion made to him by Heber C. Kimball in a letter to Willard Richards 
while the latter was in Europe. Among the saints who immigrated from England to Illinois was Miss Sarah Griffith, a very estimable lady of scholastic attainments and deep religious fervor. An attachment sprung up between her and Levi, which resulted in their marriage at Nauvoo, Christmas Day, 1843, President Brigham Young performing the ceremony. Levi and his family were with the saints in the long and tedious journey from Nauvoo to winter quarters. There he spent two years actively and variously employed. Then came another call to England, and as this second mission was to be for five years, he was advised to take his wife Sarah with him. Their three-year-old son, a delicate child, they were counseled to send to the Rocky Mountains with his uncle Willard and Aunt Rhoda. The latter, his father's eldest and unmarried sister, noted for her kindness, industry, and skill with the Nestic arts. President Young promised them that the little one would live and thrive if taken to the mountains, but could give them no assurance that he would survive a voyage across the ocean. It was a severe trial of the fond parents to leave their only child, but they made the sacrifice and on July 3, 1848, simultaneously with the evacuation of winter quarters by the main body of the saints, crossed the ferry into Iowa, and on the 8th of August started for England, traveling by ox team as far as Keokuk, which they took the steamer down the Mississippi River. The Millennial Star on December 15th announced their safe arrival at Liverpool. They were absent for over five years, during which time Levi, as one of the presidency of the British mission, traveled extensively, preaching and administering in the ordinances of the gospel. They sailed for America on the ship Cambria, April 30th, 1853. Landing at Boston, May 13, 1853, Levi and Sarah, after visiting relatives in Massachusetts, continued on to Utah where they arrived September 1853. The meeting with their little son, now over eight years old, was very affecting. He had outgrown nearly all recollections of them, but soon learned to know and love them devotedly. Levi settled at Salt Lake City, where he spent the remainder of his life, excepting a few months passed at Provo during the move in 1858. He had borne the office of high priest since the days of Kirtland, for soon after his baptism, December 31, 1836, in the early part of 1837, he had been ordained to that office. His certificate of membership in the quorum, dated December 10, 1837, was signed by the president of the high priest quorum, Don Carlos Smith, brother of the prophet. In the year 1873, he was ordained a patriarch. He did not engage again in the active practice of his profession, but freely gave advice to his friends who came to him for consultation. In the early part of his residence here, he was a member of the Standing Board of Examination of Physicians of Salt Lake City. His health and strength had been much impaired in previous years by waiting on the sick and by other hardships endured. He now gave his attention more to agricultural and mechanical pursuits, preferring the inventive and experimental and the introduction and testing of new and promising fruits, vegetables, and other plants. Also the improvement of those already in use. He was equally interested and active in every improvement, especially those of a hygienic nature. While leading a quiet life, he never lost interest in public affairs especially those pertaining to the educational and spiritual progress of the community. As far back as 1855, he was made an honorary member of the Typographical Association and in 1873 became an honorary member of the 20th Ward Institute. 
As early as August 25, 1856, he was a charter member of the Deseret Agricultural and Manufacturing Society, of which Bishop Edward Hunter was then president. At the territorial fairs held under its auspices, he served upon important committees such as fruits, flowers, medicinal plants, etc. He fell asleep in the 78th year of his age, his death a peaceful and quiet change taking place at his home in the midst of his family Sunday morning, June 18, 1876. The speakers at the funeral were John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff, Franklin D. Richards, Joseph Young, and Lorenzo D. Young. President Brigham Young was in southern Utah at the time. All testified to the worth and integrity of the deceased, referring also to his modest, unassuming life, his firmness and courage, his charitable and peacemaking disposition, along which lines his career had been remarkable. His wife, Sarah, survived him 16 years, passing away June 7, 1892. And on September 16, 1894, his wife, Persa, also entered into rest. Helen Richards Gardner, a great-granddaughter, adds the following about the life of Levi. Levi was a quiet, unassuming man not so powerful in speech, nor as so demanding as his brother Willard, but of a thoughtful and conscientious nature. In build, he was thin, while Willard was rather stout. The true brothers were constantly together in their youth, and in adulthood except when their various church duties directed them in different paths. Their closeness is evidence in the fact that Levi named his son Levi Willard, there was a fine bond of friendship and love between the brothers. In fact, the Joseph Richards family was a close-knit family, there being a bond of filial love amongst all the brothers and sisters. Levi, as a young man, was eager to learn. Also, he loved to work with his hands. He loved to mend things, little things, such as mechanical gadgets. He was very good at fine muscular coordination and doing tasks which others might consider too taxing on the nerves. He was adept at mechanical arts. He had great skill as a watch repairer. His wife once wrote in her journal, No time for conversation. Levi can't converse with me while he is working on the watches. Such fine, exacting work requires much concentration. When the pioneers were setting up a flour mill in Farmington, Utah, and the building was made ready for the machinery, Levi was the one to design it. The bands that the wheels turn on had to be exactly right. He did it very well. For very fine work, he designed a tiny, tuning lathe to make small screws and small pegs. He had horsehair attached to a bow and to the wood. As he moved the hair with his fingers up and down on the bow, he created the power for the lathe. At one time he cut off one of his own teeth that troubled him and fastened a cap on it with a hickory peg. He made his son a fife of mountain mahogany. Mountain mahogany is extremely hard and brittle and has broken many axes. He probably had to burn the hole through the wood to make the fife because it was too hard for a brace and bit. Levi's natural curiosity led him to invent many gadgets of a useful nature and that carried him into the field of agricultural pursuits. He was interested in grafting fruit trees and did much experimenting in this field with successful results. In the later years of his life, he spent many hours testing and grafting and hybridizing fruits and vegetables and ornamental plants. There was much to be done in this respect when he, as one of the first settlers, came 
to Salt Lake City, Utah, a place to be newly cultivated with a dry climate unlike that in the East. Experiments needed to be carried out to determine which kind of plants would grow in this mountain soil and which fruits could withstand the rigorous winters and do well in the short summers. Levi did much in the agricultural world to help the settlers in Utah. He was also interested in the improvement of hygienic conditions. Levi was with the prophet when he was in hiding in the underbrush near Nauvoo. He went with the prophet when he was taken to Carthage to be murdered. The prophet told him to return to Nauvoo, and whatever happened to keep the people quiet and not let them uprise. He with John P. Green received this instruction and carried it out. Levi and his wife Sarah were good friends with Joseph and Emma Smith and frequently were invited to their house to festivities or important dinner functions. He was faithful to his friend the prophet, but his faith did not diminish in the church after Joseph Smith's death, for it was rooted in the gospel itself. Levi followed Brigham Young and his councils and other authorities of the church. Levi and his family were driven out of Nauvoo by the enemies in the church in the winter of 1846 and made their way by covered wagons and ox teams to Council Bluffs, Iowa and across the Missouri River to Omaha, Nebraska, then called Winter Quarters. In 1848, Levi and his wife were called on a mission to England. They arrived safely in Liverpool, England on December 15th. They were gone for five years on this mission. Among the places they visited were Preston, Newcastle, Carlisle, Manchester, Liverpool, Cheltenham, and London. Levi was a counselor in the British Mission Presidency and traveled extensively preaching and administering the ordinances of the gospel. Quoting from the Millennial Star of 14 May 1853, Elder Levi Richards with his lady embarked on board the steamer Cambria for Boston on the 30th April. Elder Richards has labored upwards of four years in these lands, a considerable portion of the time as counselor to the president of the church in the British Isles in which capacity his labors have been eminently useful to the church generally. His many years of familiarity with the prophet Joseph and of association with the highest councils of the church and his constant service in connection with it have afforded him qualifications for usefulness with which few are endowed. The wisdom of his counsels has seemed to render them commendable to all who have enjoyed them. They have been such as could be acted upon with full assurance of the favor and blessing of God. His labors have been faithful and diligent to build up and encourage the saints, and so extensive among the British conferences as to be almost universally known among them. A former mission of two years in England and his late mission have secured to him an undying remembrance with many thousands whose faith and prayers go with him as he journeys to the valleys of the mountains. Levi settled at Great Salt Lake City in the area where Richard Street now runs, just south of the Temple Block. From South Temple to about Second South, and from West Temple to about State Street. The land was divided out to the pioneers, and the three Richard brothers were given this land to divide among themselves. At one time, Levi owned much of Main Street from South Temple down to Second South, a piece of land which today would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the Richards were not financiers and were not primarily interested in dollars. The pioneers were interested in good farmland and water enough to produce what they needed for food. Levi certainly had that. Blessings of the true gospel and a chance for education 
and learning and the finer arts of life were the goals of Lephi, and he certainly achieved them. In the Deseret News of April 11, 1855, it was noted that about a half a dozen yearling peach trees were in blossom in Dr. Richard's garden. In 1861, the Deseret Agricultural and Manufacturing Society awarded him a diploma second class for the second best cucumber in the annual exhibition in the Great Salt Lake City. In 1875, Samuel Whitney Richards and his two wives, Mary Ann and Helena, took up some lily bulbs up to Uncle Levi's and then brought home Uncle Levi and his washing machine, where Samuel had been urging him to complete. They tried it out and to their satisfaction, then took Uncle Levi and the washer home. Samuel was eager for the machine for his family, and besides, it seemed the two men had plans to start a business manufacturing such machines. Levi died 18 June 1876, so the project was not carried out. Patriarchal Blessing by Joseph Smith, Sr., 15th April, 1837. At a blessing meeting held in the Lord's house in Kirtland, this the 15th day of April, A.D. 1837, Joseph Smith, Sr., the patriarch of the church, being present and holding the meeting, a patriarchal blessing was conferred on the head of Levi Richards. Brother Richards, by the authority of the holy priesthood and in the name of Jesus Christ, I lay my hands on thy head and confer on thee a Father's blessing, a blessing which shall reach thy posterity. They shall see thy name recorded in a book of records. Thou standest to me as an orphan. Thou hast no father authorized to bless thee. I bless thee with blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which contain the blessings of heaven and earth. Thou mayest have the priesthood, mayest have faith and a certain knowledge of the Son of God. Thou shalt have knowledge to make thee wise unto salvation, being filled with the Spirit of God. I pray God to bless thee that thou mayest comprehend all things, comprehend the wisdom of this generation, comprehend the mysteries of the kingdom of God, and the part thou must take. Thou must comprehend the nature and design of all the things around thee. Thou must lay hold on the powers of the Holy Ghost and be a mighty man of God. Thou art a chosen vessel of God. He has seen thee from eternity. Yea, thou art a chosen vessel to do the work and will of thy Redeemer. God has known thy lineage and thy blood. Thou art of the house of Abraham through the loins of Joseph and Ephraim. Thou shalt have power over diseases. Thou shalt have great knowledge of herbs. Shall be a mighty physician. In the name of Jesus Christ, I seal on thy head by the powers of the priesthood. I seal thee up to eternal life. Amen and amen. Levi Richards and Sarah Griffith were the parents of one child. Levi Willard Richards was born June 12, 1845 at Nauvoo, Hancock County, Illinois, and was married June 16, 1873 in the Salt Lake Endowment House to Louisa Lula Green. She bore him seven children. Louisa died Friday, September 8th, 1944, aged 95, at Salt Lake City and was buried Monday, September 11th, in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Levi Willard Richards was married June 16, 1884, in the endowment house to Persis Louisa Young. She bore him one child. Persis died Saturday, November 25th, 1944, aged 80, and Salt Lake City and was buried Tuesday, November 28th in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Levi Willard Richards died Monday, March 30th, 1914, aged 68 at Salt Lake City and was buried Friday, 
April 3rd in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Total known posterity of Levi Richards as of 1993. One child, eight grandchildren, 20 great-grandchildren, 64 second great-grandchildren, 107 third great-grandchildren, 10 fourth great-grandchildren, for a total posterity of 210. With 87 total spouses of children, grandchildren, etc., the total posterity, including spouses, is 297. As descendants of these fine and faithful people, let us remember their strong, wonderful qualities and try to make our lives to make them proud of us.